welcome. My name is Brett Rademacher, and with me, Harold Smith, and we do a weekly discussion on articles he's written uh, that are posted on hethathasanear.com, and we're doing a new series starting out. Um, it's called The Birth Series, and the first article is The Magi, and or The Maggie, no, just The Magi. And uh, what we always encourage you to do is read the article. Don't just listen to us. There's a lot of additional material in every article that we don't have time to cover as a general rule. Uh, more detail, links to word definitions, links to scripture verses, links to other articles that are interrelated and then sometimes off um, Herald site links to diff additional content that really go into great detail about a, a concept that he's trying to clarify in his articles. So with that, welcome. Harl, today's article, the Magi. How do you want to? How do you want to intro this? Who are they? Who are they? Who are they? Where'd they okay. come from? Okay. Where did they come? Okay, and and they're also known as Hebrew. the three wise men. The three Hebrew. wise men. Yeah, all right. Some, some some people might not even be familiar with the word Magi, so I I think that's part of what uh, you want to clarify is what it actually means and who they are, right? The, the Magi does, doesn't really, does not appear anywhere in scripture in the original languages, only in religious tradition. So, okay, so you're saying that that, that actual word is not a word, a scriptural based word. It, it's, Magi is a Latin word and it's the plural of the Latin magus which is borrowed from the Greek magos, as used in the Greek text of the Gospel of Matthew, and simply means wise men. Now, now is, would the word magician be sourced out of that word? That, that was something like, it can I, also mean sorcerers, yeah. Really? Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, that's, that's interesting. Yeah, from, you know, the, from, from the Greek mindset, people with uh, connections to the, the spirit realm um, ranged in, you know, in the, had a wide ranging definition, anywhere from, you know, being wise and, and to being mysterious, to, you know, being a dedicated sorcerer. The identification of the wise men as kings is linked to Old Testament prophecies that seem to have the Messiah being worshipped by kings. Uh, in Exodus uh, 60, verse 3, Psalm 72, 10, and Psalm 68, 29. I want to pause there a second. You identify with this, because I want to set this up because you cover it later, actually towards the end of the article, but I, I do want to bring this up. What is the, um, this, um, where was I? The, the concept of worship is not, I'll, I'll just plant the seed. It's not what people think it is. It's not translated or communicated correctly, right? So... You want me to delve into that little? No, bro? no, no. I'm just planting that seed for later because that's brought up a lot in in some of the initial verses and also touched on throughout your article. But you it, you wait till the very end to clarify that. So I just want to point that out ahead of time so people have that seed planted. Okay. Um, what happened here was was the early biblical scholars reinterpreted Matthew in light of their uh, in light of, of those prophecies that we just mentioned and and elevated the wise men to kings although there's just no scriptural or historical evidence to support that conclusion um, it just sounds good and uh, you know by by 500 CE all commentators, had pretty well adopted the prevalent tradition that they were kings and uh, limited to just three in number um, associated with the three uh, gifts involved. Um, 
but according to his, historical records, the wise men recorded in scripture were Hebrews looking for their Hebrew Messiah. There, there would have uh, most probably been a contingent of them traveling together over that distance, eight or 900 miles to uh, Jerusalem for safety. So, Okay, so, so what's your basis for saying that they're Hebrews? Because that's something that most people, that would be the first time they've ever heard that for a lot of people, never heard that before. The first time I heard you say that, I had never heard that before. Israel has been invaded multiple times by the ruling world powers. Um, first, it was the Assyrians that came in um, until the, the city of Babylon finally rose up against uh, their hated enemy and, and burned it to the ground, um, the city of Nineveh which was the capital of the Assyrian Empire. And the chief of the Babylonians um, was Nebo, Nebopolassar, who was succeeded by his son and the most known of these, these kings, Nebuchadnezzar II. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar was the equal of all of the great Mesopotamian conquerors. No, what, what do you mean by equal? Um, he, he was, he, they all brazenly just took power wherever they could. And they would invade countries like Israel and, and just completely subjugate them and have them, uh, you know, forcibly uh, obey the rules of that of that particular uh, empire. In keeping with, with, their, with their practice, um, they, they forced a large part of the Hebrew population to relocate, numbering possibly up to 10,000, you know, according to different, uh, different uh, historical records. These, these Hebrew deportees were largely upper class people and crafts people, um, and who once once they were relocated, they never left the region, but joined an already sizable uh, Hebrew population who had earlier been transferred to the region by the Assyrians. So, this Hebrew population just they were known as the New Babylonians or the Chaldeans. They just kept uh, increasing and so so when you hear the word Chaldeans those are really Hebrews that have been relocated yeah wow didn't know that um, Chaldeans that or Chaldeans because I've heard it say Chaldeans or Chaldeans 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 I've heard it saying both ways yeah and you know they that that Moniker was given to them by Nebuchadnezzar. Okay. Uh, they didn't pick it on their own. <laughs> um, and um, the, the, the conqueror gets to name you. That's that's the rule. Oh, a conqueror can do whatever he wants. Exactly. So you get a you get a new name not only as an individual like uh, uh, Daniel did, but you also your your people get a new name. Right. Gotcha. Um, so the book of Daniel uh, tells us how Daniel and his three friends uh, were brought in exile to Babylon with this he, other Hebrew contingent after Nebuchadnezzar uh, put, put down the first Judean revolt um, in about 600 BCE. And chapter five of Daniel relates the story that I'm every, everybody's, I'm sure everybody's familiar with, um, about the story of uh, King Belshazzar, Bal the uh, successive son of Nebuchadnezzar, being uh, killed 
and Darius the Mede becoming the king of Babylon, uh, incorporating it and its Hebrew contingents into the uh, realm of, of Persia. Um, we have to understand that in the Middle East, then as it is now, um, those of rank and power were often give, given dual surnames. Um, the, um, the, the present uh, leader of the Palestinians uh, mm -hmm. is a perfect example of that. He goes, he goes by two or three different <clears throat> surnames depending on uh, the context of the people that he's in relationship with. But the, the like, like Prince Charles, for example, modern day, you know, he's got a bunch of titles, right? Would that be a, a similar example? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so most probably Darius the Mede, you know, he was king over the Medes. And when he conquered uh, Babylon, uh, he also rose to power as the king of Persia. Uh, and, and he was named Cyrus. Uh, and while the Babylonians ruled the world in the 6th century uh, BCE, in the course of about uh, 500 years, they ceased to exist. And it's, it's remarkable, but it's even more uh, astounding that their successors, the Persians, ruled by Cyrus, had not even existed before. Uh, so in, in 560 BCE, Cyrus the Great, as he, came, as he was known, became the king of Persia. Uh, uh, it was a small state in the Middle East and within 30 years had replaced the Babylonians, uh, the Babylonian Empire with his own, and uh, was a contemporary of, of all of these other great uh, empires at the time. Uh, and the Hebrew contingent that had been uh, forced into the region by the previous empires largely remained in this now Persian empire. You know, and the thing that, the thing that stands out to me you know, reading this, going over this, is the, the historical context that this gives scripture sets the stage for an entirely different uh, reality than the narrative most people think about when they hear, you know, the Christmas story, the, you know, the nativity scene. Those, those things are based on basically legend. <laughs> well, and yeah, religious tradition. I mean, yeah. But I mean, it's it, it's act well because you could say religious tradition. But if you look at you know uh, secular society as a whole, you know it's almost like they're 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 Christmas stories, they're fables. But it's the stuff of legend. You know, it's it's almost like a, a, a Greek or Roman mythology where you've created a story that is has no basis for for fact. And and, it, and the general and the general culture, not just Christians. But the general culture, you know, that's the story. And, and, and people, I mean, we're talking about events that happened 2,000 years ago. Right. And most people don't, don't understand that, for instance, Santa Claus was a character that was developed by the Coca-Cola company in the mid 1800s. <laughs> Gotta sell that Coke. That's, you know, I, that's, I, I, we, we, we could probably say uh, without too much um, error that that's probably the most successful advertising campaign of all time. Absolutely. And it's only 150 years old. So you can imagine how much change has gone into this story over 2,000 years? Um, and, the, you know, the, the popular myth that he was 
born in a stable full of animals pooping and pissing all over the place. It's just, it's just, it, it, it doesn't make sense. Um, and um, why, why, why do you say it doesn't make sense? Because a lot of people think that's the story. So when you say it doesn't make sense, what's your basis for saying it doesn't make sense? You've got sons, right? I do. I have four. Would would you allow them to be born in such a unclean place? Well, the the general the general story is they didn't have any else uh, other place to go, so that was the only option. Um, I know, but <laughs> if you if you read the book of scripture, you know the way it's presented. Um, and, and if you go through those begets that everybody skips over because it's so boring, you know, they it's a lot were, of begets, man, after about four or five, your, your uh, mind starts to wander. And, and you want to get quickly to the blood and gore of everything that's going on. But if you, if, if you take those begets and, and look at them for why they're there, um, you begin to see that there is a, um, a storyline that has developed from Boaz in the book of Ruth, who um, epitomized the, the station of the kinsman redeemer, a kinsman redeemer. Then you realize that that um, Joseph and Mary and Yeshua uh, came to Bethlehem because of a, uh, a tax census that had been decreed by the Roman Empire. The reason they had to go to Bethlehem was because part of this tax decree was that um, all the men would have to return to their um, to their families' uh, home turf, and for Joseph that meant Bethlehem. Um, and you know, Boaz was the great grandfather of King David. Um, <clears throat> through whose lineage came Joseph, wedded to Mary, who was of the lineage of Nathan, also connected to King David, who gave birth to Yeshua, known as the Hamashiach, or the Hebrew Messiah. Um, and Boaz owned a home with a threshing floor in Bethlehem, which by right of inheritance was handed down to succeeding generations uh, with a threshing floor in Bethlehem, which by right of inheritance uh, came um, to Joseph. So uh, you're, you're saying that th there's the possibility that they were basically going to a family homestead, so to speak. Exactly. And, um, but, yeah, but, but what about this? There's no room in the inn. Well, <laughs> there, if you look at the, the Greek word for inn, it's ketaluma. And ketaluma is more frequently used in scripture, uh, translated as the English guest room than it is an inn. So it's not like a Motel 6. No, it's just, no. It's just a, a house that was built on the grounds of, um, you know, the, the, the threshing floor and the land around it. This house was built on it. And because that threshing floor, you know, Joseph had, had a partial inheritance in that. And so he was going back there and they went uh, to the house and... Um, when it says there was no room at the inn, in, in, in Hebrew custom, uh, Hebrew going according to the Hebrew uh, 
Talmud and Tanakh and uh, Torah, uh, a woman who is pregnant um, has an issue of blood, issue with blood. And to be, because they were devout Hebrew um, people, that there had to be um, a separation during the delivery of that child ah. and, and for another 30 days until she became ceremonially clean again. So it was that, so that was, that was a traditional uh, Hebrew cultural thing for any woman that was uh, having a baby. That's correct. Ah. <clears throat> and so when she, to, when she had that baby, she moved um, up the road a ways to this tower of the flock, Megdal Eater. And it was, it was in the uh, lower portion of this tower that the, um, there was a ceremonial birthing room for sheep giving birth to lambs and then the lambs being inspected and taken care of until they were uh, offered up as a sacrifice in the temple. And so this, this ceremonial room had to be completely clean. It was, it was overseen by um, Levitical priests who were um, set aside for this particular purpose, either <clears throat> primarily through their descendancy, you know, wherever they, they came from. Uh, there was usually a priest in the in the lineage somewhere, and, and so so. But I want to clarify, you know, just point some out that just make sure everybody got this. So, Yeshua was born in a room that was specifically designed for for lambs to be born. Exactly. Wow. <laughs> and there, in this room, they had a manger, and a manger was not a feeding trough. Uh, a manger was actually a double-hewn uh, limestone rock um, in which the newly born lambs were placed in, and they were wrapped with swaddling claws to restrain their <laughs> around so that they wouldn't hurt themselves because they had to be without spot or blemish in order to be used in the temple for the uh, twice daily offering of the Tamid. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> and, and uh, the, so when it's not, it's not a far um, uh, leap to get Yeshua lying in this manger in swaddling cloths. Wow. Uh, well, that's, that's a whole different, that, that's a whole different perspective with real meaning. So I asked you earlier, would you allow your sons, one of your sons to be born in such a state, even if you were totally broke? Right. Would, would you, would you want to, um, would you want to expose him to all of the. Exactly. Yeah, well, you know, you always got to be careful about how you answer questions like, would you want to? Because you never know where you'll end up, right? <laughs> the point I'm making is, is that never here, say never. The, the point I'm making is that here is Yahweh, the, the God of, of all creation, and he's having a son born that is pure in blood and has a purpose in keeping that blood pure through his life, he wouldn't allow him to have been birthed in such a place. Absolutely, it makes it makes total sense, um, especially when you give context to what the environment would have been based on both, you know, the lineage, the history, the culture, and um, the process of 
what they did with the lambs versus what was going on with Yeshua. I mean, not only is it clarity, it's, it's absolutely fascinating, the alignment. Yeah. If, and so when they say there's no room at, at the house, what they're saying is, is that there were other relatives that, you know, were coming into um, this place because of this requirement of the, of the, of the tax censure. And in order for Yeshua to have been born in that house, Mary would have been, uh, would have, would have, it would have been of a necessity for her to occupy another room for 30 days. And it was, you know, full up for that, um, for that um, event to happen. Now, uh, she had to be removed from the common living area. Right. Uh, and so, and so it, it you know, Migdal Eater, which is prophesied in um, Micah as, you know, the, the birthplace of the Messiah, <laughs> was just up the road. And um, so, so they, they, they moved up there for the birth. Um, they probably didn't, didn't stay there for, um, um, for too long a time um, until she was ceremonially clean again and was able to come back to the, to the, uh, to the common living area in, in that house. Um, but so, you know, from his birth, he's fulfilling these prophecies that get overlooked, you know, in that lineage that we're talking about. And, um, and why they would have to, uh, why they would go there. Well, let, yeah, let's, let's go back to the, the, the Magi. And, and there's some things that uh, you, you cover about, you know, um, why they were going there. You clarify some things. You clarify the time frame. Let's, let's touch base on those things. They were going there because as Hebrews, Living in and, 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 oh wait, we, we, I want to make sure we didn't lose people here. Now they were coming out of this Babylonian empire. No, had, actually, actually, it was Persia. No, no, but I was gonna, I was gonna lead into that. They, they're going from this Babylonian empire to this Persian empire, so they had been there for many years. Well, actually, that started with the Assyrian empire, which was then um, taken over by the Babylonian empire which was then taken over by the Persian Empire. And, 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 yes. And in each case, those Hebrews living in Israel were taken out and, and sent back to this. So, so, so they had these influx of new Hebrews from, from additional empires controlling it, but also from the origination. So they have this Chaldean renamed culture of Hebrews that are, that are familiar with uh, the Torah. They're familiar with scripture and, and, the, and the Tanakh. Uh, so, so these weren't just these weren't just wise guys, right? Coming out of the coming out of the east, these were people that had a definite scriptural connection with with the, with with prophecy and and understanding what was going on. They were very specific in that regard. In in the book of Daniel, we're given a timeline. Um, that that uh, supports the birth of Hamashiach. Now you have to understand every Hebrew alive understands and knows about Hamashiach. Even today, a place is set at a Shabbat cedar table, um, believing that that Shabbat could be the day that that um, Hamashiach shows up. They all believe in, in the Messiah. They just don't know who he is. And the reason they don't accept you, uh, Yeshua or Jesus as a Messiah is because all they've heard about this guy, which is why I try to make a complete separation between what Christianity says is 
the Christ, which is the Greek formulation of, of Messiah, and who the scriptures portray him to be. Um, and all these, every Hebrew, they, they, they understand who, who he is. They're waiting for his return, but all they've been heard, all they have heard about um, who Christianity believes is that person has come through Christian commentators <laughs> who didn't write the book. You know, they're just commenting on it. And, 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 they, and they have a complete disconnect, for the most part, not all, but, but have a complete disconnect from an understanding of the Hebraic culture, mindset, word meaning, uh, definitions, that, that whole thing. So it, it doesn't even compute with them. Like, for the most part, they're just like, what? That's what are you right. talking about? Um, uh, to reinforce this, when I was living in Israel, um, there was a bus that ran from the Mount of Olives uh, down into the city that was notoriously late all the time. <laughs> Some of the other buses got late, but you know, you could kind of rely on them. But this mm -hmm. Particular bus was it just always late. So I'm standing in this pharmacy in the um, the uh, <clears throat> marketplace in Jerusalem, waiting to pay for some aspirin. I think I don't even remember what I was getting. Right. And there's this guy standing next to me, and he looks at me. He says, uh, "You're American." I said, yeah. He said, uh, you know why the Messiah hasn't come yet? I said, no. He says, because he's still waiting on the 413 from the <laughs> 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 Because the scripture says he's going to come to the Mount of Olives, you know. Anyway, um, so... So when we look at these wise men, we have to look at them from the perspective of the Hebraic, the, the Hebraic culture that that they that they were uh, presented in. So to say that that there were wise men from the east is is in that day meant the the empire that although it was in decline with the rise of the Roman Empire, which took over everything. So now you got yet another one on top of that mess. Um, uh, it was still Persia. Uh, it, was, it was an existing uh, empire. Uh, that even today it exists as Iran. Iran. And um, these men had to be Torah keepers of the Hebrew contingent still living in Persia in order to be knowledgeable of the writings of the prophet Daniel. Um, and this, and this um, timeline for the birth of the Messiah. And it would only be Hebrews that would be following this thing, uh, you know, with events taking place around the world that they would, you know, get, get wind of, um, because nobody else would care. <laughs> you know, it was, it was buried in scripture. It was many years ago. It was from, you know, a, a culture and a civilization that was far removed. And so somebody would have to, to know the language and the context and the culture in, in the pro prophecy, and then and then th something would have to motivate them, right, to take off because it's a long trip. Right, like I said, it's about eight or nine hundred miles. Now eight hundred nine eight hundred nine hundred miles today. You know that's that's one day. You know hard driving, two days medium driving in a car. You know a plane trip. You know a few hours, but eight hundred nine hundred miles back then. That's oh, a long time. On foot or on a camel, and, and 
like I said earlier, carrying this this big contingent of people. Yeah, maybe a couple months, right? Oh, Two, three months? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, easily. Yeah. And, and everybody thinks that they were following this celestial event in the sky called, you know, the star in the sky. And, um, but when we look, um, in scripture, stars are used throughout the Tanakh or what is called the Old Testament to reference the children of Israel. Uh, and more specifically, a prince. So keeping Torah also gave them an awareness of the prophecy of Balaam, who was uh, from the town of Pethor on the Euphrates River near Persia uh, in Numbers 24, 16. And Balaam's prophecy specifically mentions a star coming out of Jacob, and we have to remember Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob was renamed Israel. So when uh -huh. we think of Israel in the proper um, Hebrew context, it's not a nation state. It's not a piece of land. It's a family. It's a people um, whose father is Jacob. Jacob, Jacob had uh, 12 sons. And, um, and, you know, the scripture chronicles all the events that happened with those sons. But, we, but it, most importantly, we just need to remember, we're not talking about some celestial event in the heavens, uh, but they were following this star that came out of Jacob and Judah was from the, the lineage of, uh, Yeshua was from the lineage of Judah, you know, one of those sons. Uh, so they, when, when, it, when, it say, when it says that they saw his star in the east, uh, simply meant that while uh, they were in the east or Persia, they saw events unfolding in Israel as prophesied by Daniel in the scriptures. And this is what motivated them to get up and make that arduous journey. So, so was it just a scriptural hunch or were they prompted by Jehovah? Did they just like say, hey, you know, let's go check this out? What would cause these guys to go at, a, and, and another thing you point out is, you know, the time frame of when they show up and, and actually, you know, you know, following this quote unquote star, they had to ask for direction. So obviously the star wasn't, uh, you know, uh, giving them all the information, you know, this proverbial now, star. Uh, in the, the Christian tradition is there's this star sitting in the sky that's brighter than any other thing around and it doesn't move. And so they get up and they, and they follow that star until they come to the place where uh, Yeshua was born because the star is directly over it. But that's not what the scripture says or even alludes to. Um, what they're doing is they're following, um, they, are, they, they are motivated to see this prince because all of these Hebrews understood that from the time of Adam, they had been separated from this from this intimacy of Echad with Yahweh. And the Messiah, his purpose was to reestablish that Echad being one with the Father. If you and, and, and I don't think, I don't think, you know, most outsiders, you know, uh, non-Hebrews, uh, even Christians, can can fathom that, right? You're, you're talking about here was this people group that had that was that had come out of this uh culture and and journey and history and 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 this is something they just yearn for right if they're truly followers th this is something that is just probably ingrained in their dna it's a constant yearning and waiting uh you know i've seen 
writings where you know rabbis that are truly waiting you know it's 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 a very big deal and and there are some rabbis that say they're it <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> yeah you don't yeah. have to wait anymore you know come give me your money I, I, yeah <laughs> <laughs> so, but 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 I, I we we can't really relate to that. You know, most people don't don't get how ingrained that is into to that history and that culture. And that people we're talking thousands of years now. You know, you know, our our culture is what happens in the next five minutes in in the United States, right? <laughs> That's our culture. It's like our culture is tomorrow, and it'll last for five minutes, and then we have a different culture. <laughs> Well, that's that's what I was referring to earlier about it just being 150 years. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but so so they're 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 wanting to see their redemption. They you know it's it's kind of like um, if you knew uh, some historical event that affected your life intensely was going to take place eight or nine hundred miles away um you probably you know i was in korea north uh, uh, south korea when woodstock happened and i was i was trying to figure out you know how could i get out of here and cross the pond to go to that i mean i was seriously in you know contemplation of that and that, that that's funny <laughs> but that's i mean you know, it's easy to see with in the context of how all of this is presented, why these guys would want to get up and, and make that trek. Right. They wanted to see for themselves the king, their king. And um and uh we see that when when they got to Jerusalem, the reason you know, if the star was right directly over the place of the birth and it never moved, all they had to do was keep following the star and they would have wound up there. But when they got into Jerusalem, uh, they started asking directions, which tells me they didn't know which way to go. You can't have it both ways. You know, uh, whenever I'm talking to somebody that they're saying one thing and then saying another, I say, hey, you can't play both sides of the fence, right? You can't, you can't say the star, the star was was um, directly spotlighting where he was, and at the same token, they're going to Herod and ask him for directions. That's correct. You, you can't yeah. play both sides of the fence. <laughs> pick, your, then, pick, pick your side. Uh, so they got directions, and it says in um, Matthew 2, um, verse, uh, verse 12, 11 or 12, I can't remember, um, that they went to the house where Yeshua was. He'd already been born. And they had at least gone through the 30 days of separation for Mary. They had come back into the house with the child. And it could have been um, because of Herod's uh, command in Matthew uh, 2, 16 through 18, where uh, in what became known as the Massacre of the Innocents that included boys up to two years old, um, the wise men came days, months, or possibly even years later. And, and see, see, that makes sense because if you look at, if they showed up right on time, right? Yeshua was born, they're right there, right after delivery. And, you know, they had just spoken to Herod about, you know, directions. And, and then Herod comes back and says, hey, we need to kill all the babies, two or under. It, to it makes total sense that they did not show up right away and it, it was in a, a, you know some kind of time period uh, uh, it obviously extensive because he said up to two years right and you know he was wanting to cover he was wanting to cover uh, everything you know the, the, all, the full gamut yeah and and, uh, and and that's a pretty 
that's a heavy, heavy, uh, you know, command to go out and kill little babies, all of them, right? Male babies under two throughout a whole region. That's pretty extreme. Now, there was some kind of event that was taking place once they got to Jerusalem because it said that they still, they followed that star, you know, to the, um, to the, um, to the house. Um, there was a, a friend of mine when I was living in Texas that had a testimony of coming out of <clears throat> one of those uh, Eastern Bloc countries that was uh, taken over by the Russians. And in his testimony, he said he and, and, and a couple of friends were sitting on the porch one night and all of a sudden this blue orb, you know, about the size of a head appeared just hovering about waist height, uh, you know, before him. And he could see it and one of his friends could see it, but there was a third guy that couldn't see it. And this, this orb began to move off through the woods and uh, he had received a prophecy uh, a couple of nights earlier uh, at a secret gathering and that said when uh, when when you um, when you see the 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 light follow it you know and of course everybody kind of thinks you know well <laughs> you, you can pull one of those out of your hip pocket for anybody but then the next night here is this blue orb light uh, in his yard and it began to move off into the woods and so they began to follow it and remember it was only two of them could see it the third guy he was just taking it by faith and <laughs> these idiots knew what they were doing and uh, that blue orb led them out of <clears throat> I forget the name of the country they were in but he, he told of passing by guards um, that you could reach out and touch and they never saw him. Wow. They went through, um, what do they call them? The, where they check everybody's passport and check checkpoints, checkpoints. They went through numerous checkpoints, just walking right by these guards, these guys, and, and nobody ever saw them and, until they arrived <coughs> in uh, West West uh, Germany, I think, is, was where they finally wound up. And so for me to read that where they, they continued to follow the star from Herod's to the house, that rang true with me. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> so then they came and they began to bow down. Okay, wait, 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 wait. Okay, so now we're getting to the end of our time and the, the bomb. We're going to drop the bomb. I'm going to set the stage for this, okay? Um, uh, at the beginning of each article, you always put, you know, one, two, maybe three verses, uh, separate verses. This time you just put one long extended verse, uh, Matthew 2, 1 through 12. I won't read the whole thing because the, the, the main point is right in the first uh, sentence and it says now after Yeshua was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the how in the days of Herod the king behold wise men from the east came to Jerusalem saying where is he who's been born king of the Jews for we saw a star when it rose when it, it when it rose and have come to here's here's the the kicker worship him so at the end of the article last three paragraphs uh, you, you touch you, you saved the bomb for last so go ahead Drop it. <laughs> well, here again, you you have to approach these words from the scriptural uh, context that they were presented in, and, and in the world um, where these Hebrews uh, lived and coexisted, um, it was not a to 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 bow down to someone 
was just a like a handshake for us. It was just a uh, recognition of the uh, imminence of who. Well, we, we see this. We see this today, where people will bow to a king uh, in Japan as a form of armor. They will. I, you know, I don't know the protocol for order or who goes first or what, but we see a bowing. Right. We see a. We see that today, even. Right. And so it's it's you know it it's not considered a it's not taking the place of worshiping the father with all of our might it's just a recognition of the uh preeminence of the person that they are uh in front of and so as, as a king as a king and we we see this and, and even today, you know, it, that's not part of our American culture. I think it's because, you know, we're, we're the, the rebels, right? We, uh, we rebelled against the empire. So bowing to us is kind of like, uh, we don't believe in it. It's not part of our culture. We just do not do it. But it, it is quite extensive throughout many other cultures that have kings. We don't do it because we're too prideful. <laughs> well, it's just it's, it has nothing to do with pride in that sense. It's just not part of our culture, right? It's not. It's 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 like it is literally inbred into our culture not to do that because we rebelled against a king. Now we're not we're not, we don't think of that consciously, one way or the other. It's just not part of our culture, right? We're we're just America, and we don't have a king, and we don't bow to anybody. Now, yeah, you could associate it with pride, but I think. It's it just the basic level. We have no reference point for that in our society, none. And yet, uh, it's still viable today. And so, the the key thing that you're you're pointing out here is this word worship is not how uh, we've been taught to think of it in this context. It's 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 completely uh, erroneously uh, portraying an imagery. And, a, and, and that, that is not correct. But the biggest thing is they're not worshiping Yeshua. And that's, that's, that's the key point that you're trying to make here in context of as God, as a God. And, and if you remember um, that they were bringing gifts to kneel, which is similar to bowing, uh, it's associated with submission and obedience and, Particularly if one kneels before a person who is standing or sitting, uh, you know, um, the, the, as the kneeling position renders a person defenseless, uh, vulnerable, and, and unable to flee. And at the, at the time, this, this veneration was typically used out of great respect for a king in spite of Christianity's insistence to the contrary, they were showing respect for their king, the king of Israel. Yes. And, and we have to separate king of Israel from God. God. And, uh, or more uh, specifically, you know, the king of Yahweh's kingdom, because we read where in the, uh, in Paul's letters where that um, all authority had been given to Yeshua with the exception of Yahweh, his father. So he, he had the authority to rule Yahweh's kingdom and yes. still does. Amen. And I, I think we should leave it there. Uh, we, we've uh, covered our time greatly, but uh, again, we encourage you, please read the article. There's links to other things that will go off into more detail um, and give you a better insight into what we discussed here. This is the frosting. Make sure you eat the cake. All right. Thank you. Amen. Amen.